Welcome back for another video. Today we're going to be looking at the differences between an off-shelf toy brand slot car and a professional slot racing car. Before I begin, I'd like to state that nothing I say in this video is intended to be derogatory or dismissive. Although I am primarily involved with high-level competition and some of the associated points of view that accompany that, I'm perfectly happy to partake of some rug racing at home, in the garden, or wherever I may be, as you will have seen in the previous video. Everybody starts somewhere, and I've not forgotten how I did. Let's begin. The two cars we'll be looking at are the Lola Aston Martin by Skeletric, which will represent our toy brand, and the Lola B0960 by Slotted, which will represent our professional racing car. Both are 132 scale models of Le Mans prototypes from the late 2000s. The full-size cars even shared a chassis, so aside from the Aston Martin styling cues and the different engines, they were pretty much identical machines. Slotted also happened to make a model of the Aston Martin version, which perhaps would have been even better for direct comparison. But unlike many people, I find the contemporary golf schemes to be rather sickly. I don't think I could handle it if there were two of these garish things flying around the circuit together. Other liveries are available. We have to start somewhere, so let's begin with perhaps the most significant difference. Wheels. Toy brand slot cars will typically have plastic wheels which are often produced in sizes determined by the manufacturer. These are push fit onto knurled axles which is often a problem if the wheels need to be removed, as the knurling will permanently damage the wheel and make it impossible to refit correctly. Professional racing cars tend to come with aluminium wheels which are fitted to a straight axle using grub screws. Slotted use an M2 thread, but other companies, such as NSR and Scale Auto, use larger screws in 040 and M2.5. Slotted provide a basic 0.9mm Allen key in every carton to facilitate maintenance, but every serious racer will have a professional hex driver, or perhaps a fixed torque wrench, like this one from Scale Auto. The advantage of using metal wheels is that they are perfectly round and can be removed and refitted an infinite number of times using the grub screw so long as you don't cross-thread anything. Wheels on professional racing cars, along with all aftermarket wheels made for professional racing cars, adhere to common sizes in terms of widths and the central boss. This is done so that tyre manufacturers don't have to make hundreds of slightly different sized tyres, knowing that if they stick to one known set of dimensions, it'll fit almost everything out there. Of course, there are still different wheel sizes for different types of cars, but by and large, Tyres will come in either 90mm or 20mm diameters, with widths between 9mm and 12mm. Scalextric actually changed their strategy in 2014, and every new model since then has been made with a common wheel size, which is great news when it comes to upgrading. Unfortunately, new releases of their older models still come with the old, unique, incompatible size wheels, as does everything made by Carrera, who are just in their own lane. This means that if you want to replace or upgrade tyres on cars like these, you'll most likely be dependent on the urethane market, where you can find handmade tyres to fit everything and anything. It's worth me mentioning that some professional cars will come with plastic front wheels. However, these are not of the same standard as those found on the toy cars. They are manufactured using much higher dimensional tolerances, meaning they are still perfectly round and are designed for straight axles, meaning they can be removed and refitted non-destructively. They will also be made to the common sizes aforementioned, so that a variety of front tyres can be fitted. This is quite important when it comes to front axle tuning, as having a selection of front tyres to choose from can help establish the front ride height and handling characteristics. Many cars will still have metal fronts, but at the end of the day, plastic is lighter than metal. It often comes down to personal preference, with some racers preferring the convenience of a screw-fit metal wheel over a few grams of weight saving and a more fiddly maintenance process with the plastic versions. However, it's not just the wheels of a professional racing car that are fitted to the axle using a grub screw. The transmission gear, be it an inline crown gear or a sidewinder or angle winder spur gear, use the same method, as do any stoppers fitted to the axles. Again, this contrasts with the fixed gear of a toy brand car, which is fitted to a null, making removal destructive. This is often why you will see complete rear axles being sold as spares for toy brand cars rather than individual components such as wheels, bearings or gears. With a professional racing car, the modular approach to the axle means anything and everything is interchangeable. In the case of gears, this is particularly convenient when it comes to changing the gear ratio and replacing worn parts. The bearings themselves on this Skeletric car are white nylon, which works fine 99% of the time. I have, however, encountered out-of-true and broken nylon bearings in the past. 
On a professional racing car, you will often find brass bearings, which are machined to fine tolerances, offering next to zero lash and a nice low friction bearing surface once oiled. The bearings in this motorpod are a spherical type, but we'll get onto the motorpod shortly. It is perfectly normal to find double flange brass bearings on other brands of car, as well as ball races and hybrid nylon brass bearings. It is worth noting Carrera cars do have brass bearings on both the front and rear axle, which is a noticeable quality upgrade over that of Scale Extra. When it comes to the axles themselves, all professional racing cars will use a high grade hardened steel axle. Toy brand cars often have a much lower grade steel axle, which can often be bent in accidents or even just arrive bent in the first place. Several professional manufacturers also offer various upgrade axles, such as hollow steel, titanium and carbon variants. The reasons behind these choices are somewhat understandable. The toy manufacturers are going to nail their axles so they need it to be soft enough to cut, and they don't need to worry about impressions left by grub screws. The professional manufacturers obviously have the opposite approach, no knurling needed and the axle needs to be resistant to impressions left by screws. Regardless, the important factor is that the axles remain straight and true, and it's only the hardened axles found on the professional racing cars that are going to achieve that. Now on to the chassis, and while every chassis for every car is unique, we will discuss the general characteristics. The Skeletric chassis is somewhat chunky and rather stiff. A professional racing chassis will be much more flexible and also lighter than that of a toy brand car. The flex helps generate grip, and professional manufacturers often sell spare chassis in various different stiffnesses to suit the different kinds of tracks. Of course, it would be completely impractical for a toy brand to offer something like this, and there's no point for them to do it, but it is a difference nonetheless. Perhaps the biggest and most obvious difference in the chassis architecture is the separate motor pod, but first we'll discuss the front axle. Toy brand cars will have a totally fixed front axle, making any adjustment impossible. Ride height must be set purely on front tyre diameter, which, as discussed, becomes a bit of a pain if you're not using common wheel and tyre sizes. On the contrary, professional cars will have an adjustable front axle where the height can be set using, you guessed it, grub screws. Almost every brand uses an M2 screw for this, except for NSR, who use their Bizarre 040. Some chassis designers allow the aforementioned slotted spherical bearing to be fitted in the front axle, so that the grub screw isn't in direct contact with the rotating axle. This is an excellent design feature and something I always use if it is available to me. The chief benefit of having an adjustable axle is of course that you can set the ride height way more easily and reliably than just by experimenting with tyre diameter alone. Don't forget, tyres weigh something, and smaller tyres mean lighter tyres. If you can use smaller tyres and put the axle where you want it, you're good to go. The front end setter is an often overlooked part of the tuning process, but really makes a world of difference to the handling, so an adjustable front axle really is a must in a competitive scenario. Onto the business end, and as we can see with this Skeletric, the motor is fitted into a rigid bracket, as are the rear axle bearings. There's nothing much going on here. The slotted, however, has a totally independent motor pod fitted to the chassis by four screws. The motor is then screwed into this bracket, while the spherical bearings are held in place by a claw joints around the mounting points. The advantage of the spherical bearings mean that any small misalignments can be compensated for by allowing the axle to remain perfectly straight while the bearings rotate within the joint. This concept is unique to slotted, and other brands tend to use fixed mounts for their axle bearings. I'm not going to talk about the fact that the Skeletric car is fitted with an inline S-CAN motor while the slotted car is fitted with an angle winder flat motor, because I'm planning to discuss motor fittings and orientation in another video. If so desired, the slotted car could also be fitted with the same motor and orientation using a different pod, which brings us neatly to the fact that by using a separate motor pod, any configuration is achievable. While some professional manufacturers have unique pods that don't really offer alternative configurations, Cars by Slotted, NSR, Scale Also and Racer all allow swapping of pods to achieve these different configurations. This is handy in a competitive scenario where a set of regulations may require one orientation or another which cars do not come with as standard. The main advantage of the pod is that this can be further adjusted for flex in order to generate grip. Even better than adjusting the pod screws is to fit a suspension kit. Pod suspension can be an absolute game changer on a bumpy or very twisty circuit while remaining beneficial, but not strictly necessary on faster, flatter or more open circuits. Not every professional car will come with suspension out of the box, in fact, many do not. 
but all of them will facilitate the fitting of suspension through their chassis and pod designs. Another point to mention about this pod is the axle offset. A rear axle offset is when the axle is set on a higher plane than the motor shaft in order to make the rear ride height lower, while also facilitating the use of larger diameter wheels. Standard slotted offsets are 0.5 and 1.0mm, with an additional 0.75mm pod available for sidewinders, which are unable to go to 1.0mm. The reason for this is because every fraction of a millimetre away from the axis of the motor shaft that you go, you will be slipping out of mesh with the transmission. Typically, you can go around 0.5 to 0.6 millimetres without having to change anything about the transmission, but above that, some extra tuning of the gear mesh will be needed. For inline cars with a 1.0mm offset, slotted have an entirely separate range of crown gears which have their teeth profiled in such a way that they mesh correctly at this distance. Other professional brands also make use of offset axles, although they're not always so easily defined. Most scale auto cars have a 0.5mm offset, while NSR do not state theirs. It has been measured to be somewhere between 0.2 and 0.3mm. In the aftermarket, it is also possible to buy eccentric bearings that can be fitted to hard mounts and generate an offset between 0.3mm and 0.6mm. This is on top of whatever is designed into the mount in the first place. For example, fitting these bearings into a Skeletric car would give just that, 0.3 or 0.6, seeing as the design position is 0, but fitting them to an NSR with its 0.2 base offset would then give 0.5 or 0.8. Alignment of offset bearings is absolutely critical for a straight axle and it's not something I necessarily recommend unless absolutely necessary. I do, however, use offset bearings on front axles where there is no other adjustment option available and our smooth rolling axle is slightly less important. We've now covered most of the differences between these two cars and there's still some important factors to consider. The design of the body is one of those. Often, a toy brand car will have clips and clamps that make it impossible for the body to float on the chassis when the body screws are loosened. This is bad. Toy manufacturers will not consider the performance handling of the car and rather give priority to securing the body so it has no chance of looking like it's falling off, which is understandable. However, that's not what we need for racing. We need a free floating body that can act as a mass damper which will exponentially improve the handling of the car over bumpy surfaces. All professional cars will have body fixing methods designed with this in mind, with more recent examples having an additional standoff tap that can be set with, you guessed it again, grub screws. These are designed to limit the travel of a loose body so that it does not bottom out on the track surface. Even the body screws themselves are an area where differences can be observed. Because professional racing cars are designed to run with loose bodies, the screws will often have a shank section that can rock against the sleeves in the chassis without the screw threads getting caught on any edges. Toy brand cars will just have a plain thread. Many professional cars also feature a metric thread pitch, giving fine adjustment for setting the body tension exactly how you need it. It is also sometimes the case that toy manufacturers use several different screw mounting points, and even different kinds of screws within the same chassis. They can be hidden or in difficult locations, which is absolutely terrible for adjusting the body float. I definitely have memories of junking over half the screws on some Skeletric and SCX cars in order to be left with a manageable number. Professional cars will usually feature just two, three or sometimes four body screws in convenient locations that allow for quick and easy adjustment. Case in point of our two LMP cars here, the Skeletric features five screws of which I have discarded two, and the Slotted features just two to begin with. The bodies themselves would also differ in design. Toy brand bodies are often over-engineered to a degree, as they'll need to survive many trips to the skirting board and swipes from the family cat. Professional bodies, on the other hand, are designed to be lightweight and fast. Although crashes obviously occur in the competitive scene, they're generally not expected to be as colossal as those that happen to cars left in the control of total novices, or perhaps young children who just enjoy crashing them for fun. It's not uncommon for a large crash to write off a professional racing body, they're simply not built for it. To illustrate this, let's put the bodies on the scales. The Skeletric comes in at 27.19 grams, while the Slotic comes in at 15.47. That's over 10 grams difference, and almost 50% of the total body weight. That's quite the difference, if you ask me. Now we've taken a look at the cars on the bench, 
Let's take them to the track and see how all of these differences manifest themselves in terms of lap times. I've come to Rockingham Slot Car Club near Corby to let the cars loose. The Rockingham track is a four lane wooden circuit with a length of 112 feet and features as part of the UK National GT series. As usual, I'll be observing the behaviour of the cars and measuring the total time and fastest single lap time from a 10 lap run. I'll be using my TrueSpeed BP2 hand controller for this test, with sensitivity on minimum and a break at around 75%. These settings will remain fixed for the duration of the test. The Skeletric actually ran quite well once the tyres were given a brief sanding. The car was perfectly drivable, although even as my first impression of the day, it did feel a little lethargic. Pushing on and driving deep into the corners presents a driver with a front end D slot to deal with, a factor of the ride height being too high and the guide blade being prevented from sitting fully inside the slot. These front end understeer moments were the only D slots I experienced with the car all day, as even if the rear broke away it was easy enough to modulate the throttle and gather it back together. It's okay. The slotted, on the other hand, left me feeling like I was in charge of a missile after driving the Skeletric. It simply blasts away from a standing start and takes corners at what feels like 1000 miles per hour. The front end is absolutely planted and if you're going to crash it, it's because you offended the laws of physics by getting too big for your hero sized boots. I didn't make any adjustments to the front ride height, it seemed there or thereabouts which is just further proof that even from the factory the car has a raceable setup on it. Doubtless, it could be tweaked for a tenth or two if desired. Going back to the Skeletric after driving the slot, it felt like I was piloting a bright blue snail, and somebody had salted all of the tight corners. Considering how I initially felt like the car wasn't really distracting itself, it only took a few laps in a professional racing car for me to change my opinion. It is perhaps worth me mentioning that the Rockingham Scale Track is one of the most technically challenging wooden tracks in the UK, with many tight turns and switchback sections. An off-shelf toy slot car was always going to have a tough time here, but the rate at which the professional car by slot it gobbled up the track really just emphasises its strengths. It is quite literally streets ahead. On to the lap times. Once again, we're going for a 10 lap run and taking the fastest time from that run. The Skeletric completed the 10 laps in 117.536 seconds with a fastest lap of 11.597. Yes, we have time to the thousandth of a second now. One good thing we can say about this is the consistency demonstrated in the Skeletric vs Carrera video has carried over onto the club circuit, with only a 2 second variance from the best time over the whole 10 laps. That is a more than worthy compliment, but unfortunately it was about to be embarrassed by the Slotit. 10 laps for the Slotit were completed in 98.266 seconds, and the fastest lap was 9.827. Yeah, that's right. The laps were so consistent that the decimal rounding made the fastest lap slower than it actually was, and if it was multiplied by 10, would give a longer time than was actually measured for the 10 lap period. In other words, every one of the 10 laps were the exact same as the fastest lap within one significant figure. That is insane. I've been slot car racing for nearly 20 years and I can honestly say that I've never seen anything like that before. I was truly gobsmacked. Perhaps the stars were just aligned correctly today, but whatever the course, I don't think myself or anyone else will ever put together a more consistent run than that. I remain stunned. The fact that the lap times from each car were nearly two seconds apart is neither really here or there. It simply demonstrates that the professional racing car by Slotted is a better, faster car that is much more capable of tackling a racing circuit like Rockingham than the Skeletric is, and that, of course, is the purpose of the video. What are the reasons? Well, there are many. Better motor, more torque, more RPM, faster gear ratio, softer tyres, better materials and tolerances on components, lighter body, better weight distribution for the chassis, better front end setup. You name it, it's got it. Or just drive properly. I can't think of a single feature on a toy brand car, whether that's made by Skeletric, Carrera or anybody else, that will give even a theoretical advantage over a car like this. 
The track record for the Rockingham Scale track is only 7.9 seconds, by the way, so there's plenty more time to be found by taking a car like the Slotted and tuning it even further. But at this point, we can see that cars from toy brands like the Scale Electric, they're long disappearing from the horizon of competitiveness. So then, next time you read some scathing comment about toy brand cars from a seasoned competitor, this is why. It can be unwarranted, the cars aren't that bad, they're just not designed for the same purposes. They often look good, and can be less costly than a professional car, although not always. Regardless, the toy brand cars have their place. There's nothing inherently wrong with them, but something's got to be a knife in a gunfight, and unfortunately, it's probably your favourite Scalex or Carrera. One interesting development over the last few years is the arrival of professionally designed 3D printed chassis, designed to replace the original Skeletric, Carrera or whoever's original toy chassis, ready to be fitted with all of the top rate tuning components. The prospect of a pro conversion is a very real one, but that will be the subject of a future video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and consider subscribing to the channel. See you next time.